So uh, I want to quickly talk to you about what we got in my building. Now, everything, this channel is about geologizing everything. And uh, I'm joined here with Levi, who was five months, two days ago, and actually got hiccups right now. So I hope he doesn't um, vomit on this baby kangaroo thing. Everything here is based on geology in some way. The building, uh, which gets its raw materials from the from the rocks, essentially, it's processed somehow, to the floor that I'm walking on, which has got a large component of gypsum. And gypsum is a sedimentary rock which is just formed in high evaporation environments. In fact, Penabuco has some of the largest evaporite deposits in the world and these gypsum deposits in Penabuco were formed about 120 million years ago in the Cretaceous period. So there must have been water and there must have been a lot of salt in that water for that salt to be able to precipitate out and form these massive bodies of gypsum. I've been there and they are actually really, really impressive. Um, but probably the most uh, interesting thing here are the fossils. In fact, here, this whole floor going up here is a very famous, world famous sedimentary rock in what's called the Santana Formation or the Santana Group, depending on who you ask, which is also in the Cretaceous. And it sits just below these evaporites that I was talking about. Now, these sediments are interesting because they were deposited in an ancient lake. And, you know, where these rocks are found, there is no lake today. Um, but they proved that 120 million years ago there was a lake. How do we know that there was water in that area 120 million years ago? Well, the easy answer is fish. There are loads of fish, big, small, and even turtles, uh, fossils inside these rocks. And if you look carefully, you can see some in these rocks here. Now, the best samples are always sent to museums or they're collected by geologists and taken back to their offices. Um, but, you know, you can get every single fossil out of here. So we can have a look at these in, in my apartment. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, here we go, check it out. There's a little fish, and there's another little fish there. Uh, these fish are really, really common. They actually die in this position. When they die, similar to their modern equivalents, they kind of crick their neck like that. If you look very carefully, maybe you can see the vertebrae. Salt, salt, salt. Taffa, did you see any, uh, any salt? Yeah? Oh yeah! Raph was quite right, these are salt crystals that start to grow inside the sediment and disturb the sediment around it. And what that means is for sure that there was a lot of evaporation and the water was very saturated, the lake water was very saturated in, uh, in salt, probably in this case gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. It looks like a a little bit of a tree that's fallen off and has washed into the lake from, from a river. Which means we can say a lot about this lake. Maybe we can do that in a, in a different episode. Now, sometimes the most obvious observations are the most important. So all of these rocks that I've been showing you here were deposited one after the other. And you go to the quarry at the frontier between Penabuco and Sierra, and you can see this huge quarry with these sedimentary rocks, rocks layered one after the other. And so each of these tiles here comes from one of those layers. And the fact that you can see, for example, obvious changes in color, 
there. Some are very pale and some are very, uh, very reddish. Uh, indicates that it was a very, very dynamic environment. These color changes that I was talking about, these very deep red colors, that's not gonna be uh, pirate oxidation. That's gonna be probably changes in the content of clay. Um, and so the clay content, such as kaolinite, smectite, especially kaolinite, um, is probably influenced by variations in the amount of clay coming in from, coming from the river. And that in turn is influenced by the climate. If the climate was very hot and humid, then it's going to erode, chemically erode rocks more and therefore deliver more, uh, more kaolinite. Kaolinite is a product of a reaction between feldspars and granite, principally, with water. So lots of kaolinite means that there was lots of granite in the catchment area 120 million years ago. And that means that it was very humid, because you need a humid environment to actually erode those feldspars into kaolinite. So I, I just think it's fascinating that we can find out so much by making some very basic observations of the rock. Just from the color changes, the fossils, um, and it doesn't take much training. All you've got to do is have a little bit of patience to step back and think about the world differently. And I think that goes for many things in science. I think we're all too consumed nowadays with running around and doing our chores, getting work done, getting back, seeing the family. Seeing the family is very important, isn't it, Levi? Yes. Thank you for your patience, Levi. But I think there is happiness to be found in the small things, things that you find on the floor, things that you see in the sky. Um, and I think that if people would maybe become a little bit more scientific, which simply means to ask a few more questions, basic questions. What is this? How is it formed? How do I do that? How can I do it again? Then I think that people would probably be happier. And the fact that you're watching this means that you find what I'm saying generally interesting. Now imagine if you were to go to, to your own house, to your own backyard, or your own garden, and you were to find something that you hadn't paid attention to before. And that would tell you something about what your garden or what that area or region where you live it used to be like millions of years ago. I think, I don't know, maybe it's just me. But I know it's a sentiment shared by almost every geologist, every geoscientist. That is a genuinely uplifting experience. So I hope that, you know, you'll share that with me.